Welcome to the program, The Spirituality of the Catholic Church, as Father Paul Keenan teaches on God and man in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And now, Father Paul Keenan. I'm Father Paul Keenan. I'm with the Communications Office of the Archdiocese of New York. We're talking about the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the faith of the Catholic Church, and how it touches and affects our spirituality, because you know both of those things go hand in hand, our faith and what we believe and our spirituality. Sometimes today you get the impression that uh, the two things are really completely diverse, that uh, my faith, my dogma is one thing, and, and my spirituality is a whole other part of my religion. You, you see and hear this kind of thing all the time, and actually nothing could be further from the truth, because it's what we believe that forms the the kind of shell of our spirituality, and it's our spirituality that gives heart and soul to what we believe. The two things really go together. I remember a number of years ago, I well, I won't trouble you with how many, um, when I was a seminarian and was studying canon law, one day our canon law professor uh, brought out uh, a book, a little book called Prayers from the Ark, that someone had written, um, prayers that animals on Noah's Ark might have said. And he said to us, I want to read to you the prayer of the turtle. And he read the prayer of the turtle, and at the end of the turtle's prayer, he prayed that uh, to God that my shell and my heart may both be open to you. And he said, you know, that prayer describes canon law. He said, canon law is the shell but we also need the heart and the soul. We need both. Just as the turtle needs that hard shell, he also needs an interior heart. And I think that's true of our doctrine, of our faith, which we treasure so much. It's not just a hard shell, but underneath it there's a beating, loving heart. And when those two things go together as they do, that means that the whole man is addressed the whole man is brought to the call that God has for him. In fact, I'm so impressed with that in the New Catechism. The New Catechism, you know, has four parts. The first part is uh, about our faith and about what we believe and about what I believe. And in that sense, I think it introduces our head to God. And then there's a part which uh, is about our worship and our prayer life in public, in common, about how we worship and all the ways in which we, we worship. And that part, I think, is like our hands open up to God, our arms extended and our hands open up to God. And there's a part of the Catechism which deals with the way of Jesus. It's uh, about our morality, about what we can do and what we can't do, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And I think that's like the feet on our bodies. It tells us where we should walk and where we should avoid walking. And then finally, there's that wonderful section, the last part of the Catechism, on prayer. And the Our Father especially will talk about that in future weeks. And there's our heart. There's our soul. There's that place way deep down inside us. So the Catechism, in a way, really addresses the whole man. It addresses the head, it addresses the arms, it addresses the feet, it addresses the heart. And what a wonderful image that is for us to think about, because we long, don't we? We long to be, to be loved and to be addressed with all our hearts. If uh, someone's looking for love, they don't just say, oh, love my mind, you know. They want to be loved totally, completely, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we'll say, oh, uh, he has such a nice personality, and we wonder what that really means. <laughs> but we, we want to be addressed not that way, but we want to be loved so totally and completely. And the church does that for us in its spirituality and in its teaching. And God does that for us in creation, in revelation, in the apostolic tradition, and in the teaching of the church. And so in this first part of the Catechism, which is about uh, what I believe and what we believe, we're learning how to allow ourselves to be addressed by God within the very, very 
things that we believe. And we said when we first spoke last time that um, God addresses us first. He's always, always addressing us. He addresses us in creation. He addresses us in revelation. He addresses us in the uh, tradition and in the teaching authority of the church. That even before anything was made, God was sharing himself and sharing his life the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when he came down to making us, he made us in his image and likeness. He wanted so much to communicate to us. And we said this was a part not only of God's wanting to communicate to me, because I get lost in in my life, but God doesn't just stop there. He doesn't just communicate to me something that's it's nice to know about myself. He'll tell me my mission or what I should do or something like that. But God gives us the whole plan, the whole works, everything, the whole plan for the world, and he'll show me, if I let him, how I fit into that plan, where my life fits into the whole plan he has for the entire world. And you know, that's something to think about, because I think in this world, we often feel very helpless. I often feel that my little corner of the world can do nothing, nothing at all about the terrible problems of violence and war and crime and and sin and evil in the world. But my goodness, God says to me, that's not true. God says your little corner of the world is exactly where you can be a missionary. By living in your little corner of the world, you can influence the entire world and let the energy of my grace flow throughout the entire world. What a powerful thought that is. kind of makes my little corner of the world not seem so little and insignificant and powerless after all, doesn't it? So you see why it's important that we say both I believe and we believe. Because it's not just what I do. This is not just some little isolated phone booth that I get to sit in for 80, 90 years if I'm lucky. No, this is about influencing the entire world and being part of a much bigger plan that God has for the entire world, and he's always had it, and that he's so willing, willing, willing to reveal to us. So it's I believe and we believe. Well, in order to hear what it is God is saying, of course, we have to listen. And they say that one of the biggest problems, in, uh, particularly in marriages today, is couples learning to really listen to what each other is saying. How very often when she complains, he feels accused, and that isn't really what she meant at all. And how very often when he withdraws, she feels like he doesn't care about her. And that really isn't true at all. Growing in a relationship means growing in the ability to understand what the other person is really doing. To understand. It means listening. It means learning to listen. How very important that is when marriage is under such stress in our society these days, that we be able to listen. Well, you know, the same is true in our relationship with God. It's learning to listen, to really hear what God is saying that makes all the difference in the world. The Catechism refers to this as the obedience of faith. (laughs) That word obedience doesn't sound very good in the ears of modern man, but it's such a wonderful word, really, because you know what it means? It basically means to hear. Obedire, the Latin word, means to hear. I hear what it is that God is saying. And to really hear, to really, really listen to listen to the voice of God, just as, you know, Abraham had to listen. They called Abraham the father of all who believe, and uh, he certainly is, because he really listened to God. How he had to listen, to know that he was to be the father of many nations, to know that in his old age he was going to have a son, to know that he was supposed to lead the people and to listen to God, and not to listen to all the voices of discouragement that he would hear, and to know that he was going to have to lead those people at a time when, uh, in life when one might expect that one would not be a leader or have to assume huge burdens of, 
of new things in life and leadership. But Abraham really listened to God, really listened, really heard what God was saying, and saw in what God was saying possibilities. Mary. Mary, the, the mother of God. Blessed is she who believed, we say about her, and, and, and how that is true. How she really had to listen to what God was saying, because, of course, when the angel Gabriel came to her, St. Luke tells us that she was deeply troubled in spirit and wondered what the greeting could mean. And when the angel told her what the Lord had in mind for her, she said, How can this be, since I do not know man? She was troubled in spirit, and she knew there'd be trouble. She knew there'd be difficulties in, in saying yes to this message that God had for her. She knew that she would be challenged and, and hated and questioned and thought crazy. And heavens, she had to have known that she might have been put to death for this message. She just put all that stuff aside and said, I'm not going to listen to any of those voices. I'm going to listen to God. And she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word. Somehow in her heart, Mary knew that the word she was hearing was the word through whom the Father had made the universe. Somehow, instinctively, intuitively, through the hearing of faith, the listening of faith, through the ears of faith, through what the church has come to call Fides Ex Auditu, faith from hearing. Mary knew that the word that she was hearing was the word through whom the universe was made and the word that could guide her beyond all of the opposing voices that she would hear in her life. So the question is, how do you and I get that kind of faith? How do you and I learn to listen? Because we hear all these opposing voices all the time, don't we? We hear all these uh, people saying to us, don't be so crazy as to believe. How can there be a God who loves you? How can there be a God who speaks in the depths of your heart? Don't be silly. How can you... Look beyond the evidence of your senses. How can you look beyond what you see and hear and touch and taste? How can you look beyond power and riches and the things that really count in life? And we have those choices to make. Sometimes they're hard choices. A lot of times they're hard choices. How do we get to the point where we look beyond our own discouragement and we say, I will listen because I hear a voice deep deep down inside, deeper than the discouragement, deeper than the confusion, deeper than the silence even sometimes, deeper than my past and everything that's been done to me and all the hurts that I've accumulated because of what others have done, and deep down, down, much deeper even than the ways in which I've strayed. How can I come to hear that voice? of God. Well, you know, that's uh that's what we call faith, the um substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Faith the thing that really makes it possible for us to look beyond our discouragement and to find hope and to find life and to find inspiration and to find consolation. What is this faith that we're called to in these difficult times? Well, the Catechism of the Catholic Church reminds us that, first of all, it is a faith in someone. I think we often think about faith as though it's just faith. I mean, have faith, we say. Well, what does that mean? The Catechism tells us that, first and foremost, faith is faith in someone. It's believing in someone. It's believing in God, God alone. It's believing in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it's believing in the Holy Spirit. And you just watch, because one of the things that's going to come through the Catechism is really and truly, as you will hear repeated and see repeated, over and over and over and over again, that man is made in the image and likeness of God. The other thing that's repeated over and over again 
is that God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And as we begin to learn how we are made in the image and likeness of God, at the same time we are going to learn a lot about that trinity and who this God is that loves us and calls us so much. But the point for now is that first and foremost, faith is not just some sort of act. It's a belief in someone. To really believe in someone. See, that's why faith is so healing, because sometimes in our lives, when we really get down and out, we, we can get to the point where we say, I'll never believe in anyone again. And the reason that faith is so healing is that faith is a process of learning to believe again, despite what has been done to us, despite what we may have done, despite how cruel the world is sometimes, despite the bad breaks we think we've gotten or may really have gotten in life, despite all of that, it's faith, faith slowly growing every day, whatever way it appears in our life each day, that faith is calling us slowly, slowly, slowly to be able to believe in someone again, that someone who is God That's why the catechism refers to faith as a grace. That's a wonderful word. I love the word grace because it is, basically it means thanks. Wow, once we can say thanks in our lives, we've taken a big step toward getting over the things that have been bothering us. We can be thankful. And once we can be thankful for our lives, or at least thankful for a little part of them, One of the things we discover is that uh, we find more and more things we can be thankful for. You know, it says in the book of Proverbs, as you think, so shall you be. And uh, once we can begin to think thoughts of thankfulness, we find more and more and more and more reasons in our lives to be thankful. Because one of the fundamental principles of the life of the mind of man is that our minds tend to multiply what they think about. And if what we think about all day long are the things that we hate and the things that are awful and the things that have been done to us and how much we hate our lives and how hopeless we feel, guess what? We're going to see more and more and more and more and more and more of those things showing up in our lives. But if we can break that cycle, and if we can begin to have faith if we can begin to believe that there's something more than all of that garbage that is there in our minds and in our hearts, if we can begin to access that deeper life to which we are called right down in the very depths of our being, then we can begin to think some thoughts that are of a different nature. We can begin to think thoughts that are faith-filled, that are positive, that are thankful, that are hopeful. And the more of those we can begin to concentrate on and focus on and pay attention to, the more we can find those things showing up in our world. And suddenly our world will look like a very different place. Gosh, I didn't know the world was so good. I always remember that story of Mark Twain who talked about his father, you know, and said um, when I was 16 years old, I was... uh, I was really sure that my father was very stupid, and when I got to be 21, I was really surprised how much he'd learned in five years, <laughs> how differently he looked at the world a little bit later on. And it was the same father, same father, exactly. Well, our world can change in just that way if we begin to align our thoughts with the thoughts of God. And faith, this grace, this hearing God, enables us to do that. Faith is not only hearing and not only a grace, it is understanding. Understanding. Oh, finally, I understand. Remember I said how a relationship can really heal when the two partners really begin to understand each other? Well, faith is like that, too. Faith is when we can look at this confusion that there can be in our lives sometimes, And we wonder, where did God go? Did he go on vacation? Did he take a sabbatical? What did he do? Because he certainly doesn't seem to be around. And all of a sudden, some little thing will happen, and we can say, oh, now I understand. Well, the church has always had a tradition, which in Latin it is called fides querens 
intellectum, faith, seeking, understanding. So you see, when we believe, it's not only our hearts that improve, and not only our worlds that improve, but our minds improve as well. Our minds improve as well. See, these issues address the whole man, not just a little part. The whole man, all of us, our minds, our hearts, as we shall see, our bodies, our bodies as well. All of us are addressed by this call from God to which we are every day learning how to listen to We're talking about the Catechism of the Catholic Church here. My name is Father Paul Kinn, and I'm with the Office of Communications of the Archdiocese of New York. And together, right now, we are trying to understand a little bit about faith and what faith is. And we, we said that it's a listening, it's an understanding, it's a learning to turn away from the voices we so often hear that misguide us in our lives, and it's a turning to belief in God. I believe, we believe. No one, no one can believe alone. That's why we have a church, that's why we have a community, and it's why our faith has a language. I really like to tell people that I think faith is very much like a foreign language. You know, if you're going to learn a foreign language, you can't just learn it out of a book. You can't just sit down and and read uh, a couple of verbs learn how to, to, uh, to conjugate those verbs and to decline words and to learn the principles of grammar and to read a few sentences. That doesn't teach you the language. You really have to hear the language spoken. You have to really immerse yourself in the language until one day you say, my goodness, I am able to speak that language too. And I think faith is just like that. Faith is exactly like that. We need to immerse ourselves in faith as in a language that is spoken. And that's one of the things that church does for us. That's one of the things that community does for us. It's one of the reasons why it's so important that um, that parents form their children in the faith, right in the very home. Why the church these days, as we shall see later, refers to the family as the church in miniature, the domestic church. Because we need to have people around us living and breathing and speaking the faith and speaking the language of the faith in order for us to catch it as well, in order for us to be able to understand it, to hear it, and then to be able to say, oh, guess what? Now I can speak it. Now I can speak the language of faith. And if I'm older and if I'm an adult and if I've been wandering around out there and have kind of lost my way or gotten away from the church, gotten away from my faith, or I maybe had never had it, never belonged to a church or, or to the Catholic church, that's why it's important for me not to sit out there alone all by myself, but to come back. Because it's only within the context of a people who speak the language and who live the language and breathe the language that we are ever going to be able to understand the language. And that's why God calls us not only to be I-believers, but we-believers. God calls us to listen not only individually, but as a people. Gee, you see that throughout the entire Bible. God is not only calling individuals like Abraham and Moses and uh, Isaiah and all of the different uh, prophets and, and, and people in the Bible. He's not just calling them and saying, I want you to go out and be real rugged individuals. He's saying to them, no, I want you to form my people. I want you to form a people who know how to speak this language of my love, this language of my faith. And we need that, too, in the dark moments, in the dark times. We need to be able to listen, to listen together with others who speak the faith and who know how to say it. And then we, in turn, become missionaries of faith because we begin to kind of grope with this a little bit and to, to grow with it and to be able to speak it. And then through our efforts, we're able to, to help other people. And through our prayers, we're able to help others to be able to grow in this 
hearing and understanding this Fides Ex Audi to as well. So we are called, we are called as apostles to respond, you and I, to the invitation that God gives us in the depths of our hearts. An invitation to know, an invitation to hear, an invitation to believe. A promise, really, a promise, too. promise that's, I think, really very significant in an age which is so full of promises that get broken, an age which is so full of heartache and confusion and voices that simply say life is not worth living, voices that simply say you can't trust the other guy, there's a sucker born every minute, we live in such a violent world, I can't do anything about it, I'm helpless in the face of that. How often do we hear those things? The language of faith is God's way of telling us there's hope. You can hope. You can hear more than those wayward voices of gloom and doom and despair and tragedy. You can hear something deep down inside, which is a message of hope, a message of freedom. Because that's really what faith calls us to. It's to be free. Free to be who we were meant to be. People made in the image and the likeness of God. And so the invitation to you and to me as we, we listen is to hear, to open our ears, and to follow. Thank you for joining us today for the Spirituality of the Catholic Church with Father Paul Keenan. You may write to Father Keenan in care of the Office of Communications, Diocese of New York, 1011 First Avenue, New York, New York, 10022. 